Today I terminated Phil Brooks, CM Punk. Wait just a minute. All Elite Wrestling burst onto the pro wrestling stage like a storm in 2019, offering a fresh, well-funded alternative to the traditional landscape of the industry at the time, dominated by WWE. Their mission was clear, to create a fan-centric wrestling promotion that emphasized athleticism, compelling storytelling, and an inclusive roster. From the Double or Nothing pay-per-view launch to the weekly Dynamite TV shows, AEW hit the ground running, captivating audiences with an exhilarating onslaught of matches that truly hit the five-star mark and a commitment to progressive wrestling storylines. They were different. They were not WWE, but they were also big time. However, within the glimmering success, there were also moments where AEW president Tony Khan and others behind the scenes have made decisions that have faced criticism. Promotion faced challenges in its women's division, and lately fans have also questioned the booking of storylines overall, where occasional inconsistencies have hindered the impact of certain feuds and over-the-top characters. So let's talk about it. What are the mistakes that AEW has made up until now? It's Sports Key to Wrestling. I'm Kevin. Get into the comments below and let us know what you think. AEW doesn't have the same creative structure and management of WWE, though the comparisons are always going to be there. They're driven by a team of industry professionals and Tony Khan, and the talents in the company are given a lot of creative freedom to express themselves in their characters in a way they want that may not feel as on the script as WWE does sometimes. And while this could benefit certain wrestlers, the shows can come off sometimes a bit disorganized, possibly contrived with Outriders, Tony Khan has his favorites, and he should. It's his company. And that has caused him, though, to naturally overlook other wrestlers who've gotten organically lost in the shuffle. Look at Keith Lee, who came over from WWE with a lot of buzz. This is a guy who had a clean victory over Randy Orton. At first, he was treated like a big deal. He even became a tag team champion with Swerve Strickland. But at the moment, they lost the titles. It felt like Tony wanted to push someone else, except Lee, and that was Swerve, and Swerve has all the attention on him, even beat Hangman Page, a former AEW World Champion. Meanwhile, Keith Lee has sort of been lost in the shuffle. Having a writer or maybe some type of segment coordination could maybe get Keith Lee on TV more. And he's not the only person that has this problem. He's just an example of AEW's stacked roster of very, very over talent that is very, very lost in that shuffle. See, we keep going back to that phrase too. In AEW, there are a ton of wrestlers, but only a few of them get screen time. Look at someone like Miro, who has Superstar written all over him, and it felt like he disappeared from the company for a long time. One week he was on Dynamite, the other week he was gone. The company has been inconsistent when it comes to booking some wrestlers, and this problem could be solved with maybe some formal production team who can play a pivotal role in shaping the storylines week to week in the long term and give the characters more development, not just being sprung on us when we didn't know they were even going to be there. Additionally, writers being experts in crafting and engaging promos and segments to the overall sense of just, you know, watching a TV show with a story in it could help as well and empower the wrestlers to deliver compelling performances beyond their in-ring abilities. This is a collaborative effort. Sure, it should be different from WWE, but using some of the things that WWE has done to be successful wouldn't be that big of a problem, would it? This is still a TV show. Do what a TV show is supposed to do. The sense of being overwhelmed and juggling a lot continues as AEW also acquired Ring of Honor, which is just another brand under their banner, but also one that has a ton of history, a massive video library that has some of the biggest names in the business in the last 20 years, but it just feels sometimes like an afterthought. It cannot be a one-man show forever. If Tony Khan is running this entire thing, maybe the company could benefit from having some other creative people involved 
involved plotting out the long-term storyline. So something like Ring of Honor, which has so much value, doesn't feel like just another thing. Another major critique of AEW is the ranking system. When the company introduced it, it was heralded as a revolutionary sports-centric approach to emphasize wins and losses meaning things with the top-ranked wrestlers getting the title opportunities, you know, like they would in a real sport, not just a scripted TV show. However, as time progressed, it became increasingly apparent that this system encountered significant hurdles that undermined its effectiveness. Yeah, that means you actually have to follow the rankings, right? The fundamental premise of the ranking system was to provide a structured framework where the wrestlers could climb the ladder based on their performances, creating a clear path to championship opportunities. Yet one of the primary issues that emerged was the inconsistencies there. Oftentimes wrestlers who were not even in the top five challenged for the world title. Because of this, fans found it hard to grasp the logic behind a ranking system, leading to confusion and a lack of focus and credibility with it to begin with. While AEW's attempt to instantly Institute the ranking system was admirable. Its execution kind of failed. Sometimes they follow it, sometimes they don't. During an interview with Comic Book in 2022, Tony Khan seemed to admit that the ranking system was a mistake in some way. While the lessons learned from this shortcoming of a ranking system serve as a valuable reminder of the complexities inherent in marrying a sports-oriented approach with the entertainment world of professional wrestling. Sometimes you can't have both. AEW has also introduced the concept that has worked in MMA but may not work in pro wrestling of interim champions. This was done to maintain the prestige of the title during a champion's absence. An interim champion is typically introduced when the reigning title holder is unable to defend the championship due to injury or other circumstances. The intention behind this was to ensure that the championship remains active and relevant and not absence from the primary title holder. However, in the case of AEW, the implementation of an interim champion has faced just substantial challenges and criticism and leading to considerable debate within the wrestling community. And it's just, do, do you need it? Apparently, AEW does. The first time they used an interim champion was for the TNT Championship. This happened when TNT champion Cody Rhodes couldn't defend his title against Sammy Guevara. In the meantime, Guevara fought Dustin Rhodes for the interim TNT Championship. AEW has also used the interim title for the AEW World Championship. Only days after winning the title, CM Punk had to take time off due to injury. This led to the introduction of an interim champion. It was ultimately John Moxley who won the championship, defended it day in and day out, only to be called the interim world champion. It just feels less than, you know? I mean, it's wrestling. We don't have to do all of the sportsy stuff, do we? Could we not just vacate the title and then do a rematch when the other guy comes back? I, I don't know. I know we're getting into the weeds here. Tony Storm was called an interim women's world champion when she won the title because the former champion, Thunder Rosa, had to relinquish the title due to injury. Storm ended up losing the title to Jamie Hayter, and soon it was announced the designation of the interim world champion was dropped. Th this is all confusing and just feels convoluted, right? To some degree, it does, right? It just ended up being too confusing and honestly took away from some of the importance of the championships to begin with. When Moxley held the AEW interim world title, he really proved that he was one of the best. But then when Punk came back as the world champion, it felt odd, like Mox was just filling in for it until Punk returned. To make things right, AEW had Moxley beat Punk on Dynamite to unify the titles. It felt like a lot of effort to fix something that could have just been avoided. They could have just taken the title from Punk when he got hurt, which is what they eventually did after All Out, after he won it back. I know that's not something they planned for, but that's the way it played out. Well, you knew we were getting here. The backstage issues. Well reported. CM Punk getting into it, into a legitimate confrontation physically with Kenny Omega and the Young Bucks, who are executive vice presidents with the company, following the AEW All Out pay-per-view, where he got injured in that main event match with Jon Moxley. The press scrum that followed that show was an absolute red-hot mess. 
Punk going off controversially on the executive vice presidents of the company right next to Tony Khan in front of the press. It was just not good. There's no proper way to spin it. Even Tony Khan later on in the press conference trying to take shots at WWE felt like a really desperate distraction maneuver. But everyone was focused on what Punk just said and how he just went crazy and then things got worse backstage. This isn't the only backstage issue between talent and AEW that has been reported. It's just the biggest example of it. It's pretty clear that when certain wrestlers have a lot of power, they can cause some issues behind the scenes. This has happened in WWE and WCW in the past. The executive vice presidents, Young Bucks and Kenny Omega, being top-tier wrestlers and also decision makers behind the scenes in the company, has created some issues on the surface that you can see. Cody Rhodes was also an executive vice president with AEW when it started, but he decided to leave the company for WWE in 2022. That was a huge defection that turned out to be another mistake by AEW, not being able to retain top-level talent who have these issues backstage. To be honest, AEW did not use the American Nightmare to his full potential. He was stuck in mid-card feuds or upper mid-card feuds rather than winning the world title because of some weird scenario where he said he couldn't challenge for the world title because of a loss to Chris Jericho at Full Gear 2019. Yeah, that was a questionable decision in retrospect. He was booed relentlessly at times during his promos in AEW because of this, and the jump to WWE was only a logical decision for him in retrospect as well. Cody got an incredible reaction upon his return to WWE, and he became even more popular as the weeks went on. His promos are connected to WWE's fan base, and he seems destined to become a champion there. He is still a favorite to end Roman Reigns' historic streak. AEW could have made him into that type of megastar on their platform, but instead they let him go to a rival promotion. Why? We don't exactly know, but still, losing Cody and losing other talent like him is a big problem. You want to compete with WWE, you have to compete for the talent. Back on the CM Punk topic, we already discussed the all-out media controversy, the big brawl out at All Out, and what happened with it. Yeah, there were suspensions and injuries, it had an effect then, and there was some thought of the uncertain times of his return to AEW after the brawl out. But almost a year later, in June of 2023, he made a comeback and even got his own featured role on a new AEW weekly television show, Collision. Bringing him back to AEW was a no-brainer, a big star who could draw fans and sell tickets. But Tony Khan failed to get both parties on the same page for the sake of the company, and the heat kept increasing between people that are believed to be in the punk camp and believed to be in the Young Bucks camp. And it, and it continued into AEW's biggest show, All In, Wembley Stadium, their biggest night, where CM Punk took a dig at Punk on camera unnecessarily with his Cry Me a River line. Real glass! The Go cry me a river. That sparked a backstage confrontation between Jack and Punk, resulting in the best in the world being dismissed from the company after opening their historic stadium wrestling show. It was a disastrous move by AEW. Some people question it. Other people say it was the right thing to do. Considering Punk was still one of the biggest draws, it's something they're going to have to live with moving forward. Tony Khan could have handled things differently. His team could have, for the sake of business, kept Punk on board. And no, he had to announce Punk's firing in front of the hometown crowd of Punk the day before a big pay-per-view just a week later. I missed all all this turmoil, the voice of the voiceless voiced his displeasure on social media in vague ways and finally made a shocking comeback to the WWE after nearly a decade. To massive social media numbers, increased TV ratings from Running at Raw, and a massive amount of speculation about what he's going to do next. The wrestling world is anticipating what CM Punk is going to do next, but what he does next is going to be in WWE and not AEW. And as someone said before, that's the bottom line.
Reflecting on the missteps within AEW, it's clear that Tony Khan and his team, while steering the promotion to incredible heights, has encountered circumstantial challenges along the way. This is a part of the game of professional wrestling at the big blockbuster international level. Acknowledging these mistakes is a vital step towards progress. What do you think AEW needs to change? What do you love about AEW? Let us know in the comments below.